Afternoon all. Let's have a look at a really dramatic game in the Tower Memorial Tournament. Uh, Carlson playing White, who's 2-8-2-6 against Galefand, Boris Galefand, who's uh, qualified you know, in the World Championship recently, um, uh, who's 2 7 four, four. So no bunnies, no weak players in the Tower Memorial Tournament. Uh, it's, the, it's one of the strongest tournaments uh, all year. Uh, but there is closer to home, uh, to my home where I live in London, London Classic next month. I'll be playing in the Fide Open and some of the, the top stars will be playing in the London Classic. So maybe I'm going to be interviewing some of these guys uh, next month. I'll try and take my iPhone in and uh, avoid being be, being defaulted. But um, okay, so Magnus playing white. He kicked off with D4. And um, after D5... Uh, C4, the ultra solid Slav defense. And um, by the way, I might be putting a playlist for Slav defenses because we've had a few uh, a few master games annotated with the Slav, and uh, it would be nice to put them all together if you want to play this with black, uh, just just for revision of, of key ideas. It's a favourite also with Imanchuk in some of the past videos on this channel. So um, ultra solid system. Um, knight f3, knight f6. Um, you know, black is not giving uh, a foothold in the centre. That pawn on d5 is is reinforced by c6, and it's not blocking that bishop. That bishop's still free at the moment uh, to come to some key squares. And in fact, after e3, uh, the bishop does come out. Uh, you know, sometimes you get the triangle with the bishop blocked in, uh, but sometimes the bishop does come out. It came out here. And after knight c3, e6. So a very solid setup from black. Magnus now plays uh, to win that light square bishop, but it's at a cost, usually, this kind of um, move, that uh, black can often get dynamic compensation going on the h-file if white uh, tries to win the bishop like, like now. Black's getting, in return for the double pawns, some dynamic compensation, a more active rook, and that could lead to pressure on h2 and tactics on g3 and stuff like that, and threats like knight g4. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes this strategy is used with effect, even with white uh, sometimes casting king sides. There have been some classic games in the past, um, and the same idea across different openings like the Kara Khan. There was a classic win of Mikhail Tal against Botvinnik once in one of the World Championship matches where, where Mikhail had sort of doubled the pawns here and castled on the king side. Uh, but it didn't really work out for black. Sometimes the dynamism can be sort of neutralised. So the question here is, you know, is this h-file dynamism going to be neutralised? Is white going to castle on the king side? Is it too risky? Well, he plays bishop d3, Magnus. Um, after knight bd7, uh, black is is being um, a bit cagey. Is he really going to castle king side, or is he actually going to prepare to castle queen side and really try and maximise the use of this dynamic h-file? Um, after castles. Uh, Magnus is not afraid of the h-file, it seems. And so he's got two bits now pointing at the sensitive h2 pawn. So he has to defend that. So what's a good way of defending it? Well, he chooses h3. OK. Now, these pawns are not greatly mobile. It's not that easy to try and smash through with g5, g4. Uh, so black, for the moment... Uh, maybe just be trying to prepare to castle queenside and, and slowly increase the pressure. But um, Boris actually, he takes on c4 here and now plays knight b6. And not move like queen c7 or, or queen e7 to try and castle queenside actually, but uh, a pawn break in the centre now. e5. So you might wonder, what, what is going on here? Why is black, who hasn't castled, uh, the king still in the centre, playing uh, this move e5, which in one way it sort of extends the scope of this light square bishop. Does it look right to play e5? Interestingly, you know, it looks as though, you know, maybe d takes e5 is worth considering. Let's have a quick uh, engine check of this position of who stands better and was actually the move um, e5 given as as an engine move. It wasn't actually just moving the queen as as I sort of would intuitively think, or maybe even to c7. 
but here actually also castle is given. That's not as fun. That's not using the H file. But uh, E5, in theory, it seems uh, technically the engine doesn't quite like E5. But what would happen if D takes E5 here? Small advantage for white. So Magnus perhaps didn't like this position. And he probably didn't want to exchange queens here. Exchanging queens is probably no big deal for black. In fact, black ends up, looks to be dead equal. Okay, so that's curious, that e5. Uh, but maybe it's a logical move. So queen c2, now queen e7. And now, of course, it's pretty crude. If D takes E, Queen takes E, Black will be threatening to mate Magnus. There's no defensive knight on F3, so it's a bit elephant gambit-like. You know, there's no knight on F3, so this is quite a dangerous diagonal potentially. Not only that, you know, what's going to happen with this semi-open H-file pressure? Is Magnus uh, a bit worried? Bishop D2, and now Black does castle Queen side. So uh, Black is really, you know, Boris is really going for it in this game. This is not a grandmaster draw game by any stretch of the ma imagination. Magnus now plays a move which I think tries to emphasise uh, the Black King on the C file. He plays D5. And that is responded to by the aggressive move E4. So now that there does seem to be concrete threats that need to be considered... Uh, you know, concrete crude threats. Uh, but what is the black king safety in the pawn sack now, which has just happened? D takes c6. Well, it's not it's not quite a pawn sack yet, but it's it's structural damage after bc. It will be like fractured pawns. So here, Boris acts on the threat queen e5, and it looks to be quite a scary position with no g3 available because g3 rook takes h3 is is pretty completely lost. Look, looking completely lost with the in the threat of rook g3, among other things. So there aren't too many defensive tries here. Uh, so this is kind of probably the only move to stay in the game now um, is to play f4. Let's just confirm that. That's I guess that's the only move here that White has. F4. Oh, there there is another move mentioned. Or C takes B7, of course, is a check. Of course, white can play that and then, then play a move. Uh, so say King B8. Now, anything other than F4, and it's a big... It's it's not good to invite the queen, basically, for this check. Check time. Queen takes G2, because the queen, you know, has got access to F3. Um, the king is, is going to have a difficult journey ahead um, to try and get to safety here. It's probably not that possible with things like uh, Queen F3 and Rook H3 coming, as this shows. So basically, F4 is forced. So Magnus is seemingly playing with fire here. E takes F3. Rook takes F3. If he plays G takes, then it is actually mate. <laughs> so Rook takes F3. OK, how does Black continue the attack here? Black plays a seemingly uh, very promising fishing pole type move. So this is starting to remind me of a, a chess cube war zone game that this h file and the fishing pole ideas of knight g4 are often uh, very effective to, to pick up points. So this is great. This is a fantastic fun game. This is totally out of the character of some of the more stodgy solid um, grandmaster games you get in the Tau Memorial, but it is the Tau Memorial. They should be having fun playing like Tau. And Boris is definitely doing that in this game. He should get some Tau points for this game, win or lose, um, or draw from this position. Um, you know, because Tau was, this is how Tau played, you know, um, aggressive, you know, exciting stuff. And this is a, a Tau-like move coming up. I wonder if you can spot it if I give you 10 seconds, starting from now. Okay. Now, not the invasion with the queen, which looks looks pretty uh, dangerous, but maybe isn't that dangerous. Actually, knight g4 is played. Now, let's objectively look. What is what is the best way to attack here? Um, is black actually doing well? Apparently, white is better. In fact, queen h2 is given as one of the stronger moves. 
Knight g4 isn't mentioned at this depth anyway. This this particular depth for depth 14, it's not mentioned. But knight g4 supposedly equal here from this this uh, engine valuation. Queen h2 check supposedly equal now. King b8 supposedly equal. Interesting. Okay, turn that off. So knight g4. Magnus plays c takes b7 check. King b8, getting the king out of trouble on that c file. Okay, and now Magnus accepts the knight sack. So there's a seemingly powerful tactic here to win uh, material at the very least. Uh, can you spot it here? What does black play here? 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, black plays this move, a deflection type move. If king takes, then the king is, is dragged and dropped. It's like a drag and drop tactic. So queen h2 will be mate. Um, so so actually, if the king goes to the only move, but the, the rook on a1 is dropping off. So basically, uh, it's turned out into a kind of positional exchange sacrifice uh, type combination uh, for white. His king isn't being mated. Uh, but um, he's the exchange down now for how many pawns? Three, four, five, six against one, two, three, four. So he's two pawns for the exchange down, which is fine. And he, he increases the battle for the center now, I think, with this next move, knight e2, because now the bishop is, is free to point across the center soon. Bishop c3 is played, but e3 looks a bit vulnerable. Bishop c3, queen e7, keeping an eye on the e3 pawn. And also, of course, the queen has, has the possibility now of queen h4 check, which along with this rook cutting off the white king from retreating, represents a fairly serious threat actually of mating too. For example, if, if g3, uh, queen h2 would be mate, um, if, if g3 was played after the check, but it's it's fairly dangerous basically the position here. Not only that, of course, black's also got other options, but rook d1 would face maybe queen takes d1 as an option. Magnus plays an interesting move now, g5. So what is the point of g5? What would happen if queen takes g5? Would that be really bad for black? In the game, Black actually did choose Rook D D one, offering this this risk. Uh, is it a risk for for White to win two rooks for the Queen? But what would happen here if Queen takes G five? Let's have a quick look at this. If Queen takes G five, apparently, okay, we've got Queen E four. Initially, Bishop F seven was being looked at, but I think now the there was a flaw found in bishop f7. I wonder what it was. Rook d d1. And this is very, very dangerous for white. So say check, check. This this looks pretty ominous, this, this attack. Drawing the king out. It can't be that healthy for the white king to be on e4 here. Uh, so knight takes, even queen takes b7 comes into the picture. Queen takes f7, yeah, white's getting mowed down here. So that's something to avoid, uh, bishop takes f7. But the move apparently here would be queen e4. And that does support, actually, I think it supports the b7 form, meaning that also bishop e5 is also supported. So bishop e5 is a key threat to parry. We see a parrying move f6. There's also an inviting move f5 offered. I wonder if f5, what happens here? Our uh, check and white would be a tiny bit better apparently. Even after, you know, black plays king, king now 96, white's apparently a tiny bit better. So that's interesting, that g5 move. If it did indeed have the idea of queen e4. Which I guess it does because g5 does clear this, this row. So after queen, if we look at queen e4, after queen g5, queen e4, it also has the benefit of preventing um, queen h4. 
as well as supporting bishop e5, as well as supporting the pawn. So that seems to be a very clever move, g5. Rook d, d1. And now we have this other question raised earlier. You know, what if white does offer the queen up for the two rooks? Is that really um, good for black? Magnus actually played knight g3. But let's have a quick examination of queen takes d1 here. If queen takes d1, rook takes, bishop takes, what does black do here? Why um, is it so bad? Okay, apparently two good moves for black at this stage of analysis, queen g5 and knight c4. And in fact, it might be, well, both of them seem to offer black something. So knight c4, knight e5, knight d3 check. Well, that would be uh, well. There's a big threat here, actually, of knight c6. So not knight takes f4, but queen takes e3, and apparently black is starting to do okay. But it seems all pretty tricky because this pawn's actually quite a uh, danger. But apparently here, this is okay for black. But also, um, there's the other possibility of queen takes g5. So bishop takes g7. Say, check. And now f5, big advantage for, for black, potentially. Why would that be? Is it to do with this e3 pawn being slightly vulnerable? It's picked on and picked on and picked on. And there's threats also on the horizon, like f4. So I think that's why uh, black is given as better. So the engine's giving a big advantage for black there. So basically, it seems as though this queen takes d1 is no good. Uh, so I would promote queen takes g5. I'll promote that variation uh, for the PGN that you can collect in, in the description of this video. So we'll promote queen takes g5 as the move here, offering black the advantage, big advantage, potentially. Okay. So Magnus then perhaps uh, wisely um, played knight g3. So a very exciting position. So knight g3 clearly uh, defends the f1 square for rook f1. Uh, e3's being held on to. At the moment, there's no way of increasing the pressure on e3 that easily. Uh, so the bishop actually goes to a different diagonal now. Bishop d6, eyeing the knight, uh, maybe with the idea of taking and then rook f1 in the future. Right, what other threats? There must be some other threats for black as well. Also coming into consideration is um, must be queen takes uh, g5 all the time. But um, so Magnus's move now is queen e2. And there was some, some talk that he was playing very, very accurate moves in the latter part of this game. So queen e2. To be honest, it's it's starting to be beyond me what the actual threats are with bishop d6. So let's let's put a token move in here to see, you know, what if what if Magnus just played a3? Would he be blasted to bits? Okay, maybe just queen takes g5. Okay, it's not particularly helpful to play a3. So um, in in this position, uh, Magnus's move knight g3 is actually given as one of the strongest. Okay, and then after bishop d6. Okay, the next move, again, one of the strongest moves. He's starting to play like a computer indeed. Magnus is starting to find computer moves. I think, um, well, it seems to be solid from the point of view, um, maybe of f1 uh, protection. The queen can also venture out maybe to b5 at some point. Um, if we give black a null move, it's difficult to give black a null move just to see what's going on. What would be white's threat? Oh, sorry, bishop takes t1. That that clarifies that white, sorry, this this move unveiled the threat, clearly now, I see, uh, of, of just taking the rook. That's why it's a good move. It just unveiled a rook attack. Pardon me. It's a tricky position. Okay, so the rook moves. That's quite, probably why the rook moves. Can't move to f1. Uh, bishop takes g3 check. Probably isn't um, that hot. Uh, let's just check that out. Bishop takes g3 check, if that was played, instead of um, rook g1. Rook takes g3, and now I guess rook f1, the queen does take, so it's also having the idea of protecting f1. 
and white would be about equal there. So okay, so queen e2 looks like an accurate move uh, from those from those angles. It's forcing uh, the black rook to move, and bishop takes g3 isn't a deadly um, capture to play rook f1 apparently. So rook g1 is played. And now another tricky looking move, queen d3. It does keep an eye on the f1 square. It does keep an eye on e3. What else does it do? Okay. Maybe in this position rook takes f7 might actually be a threat because the queen's eyeing d6. So tactically uh, that might be made use of because uh, it does look a bit precarious for the black king in some of these lines because there's also potential for bishop d5s and stuff. So here the bishop uh, was aware of being a bit uh, in the limelight here with this queen on d3. It played bishop uh, to c7. Boris played bishop c7. And now a centralizing move with the knight. So knight e4, knowing that uh, the knight is not the only one protecting f1. So this rook f1 isn't a deadly threat because the queen takes. Um, or even there's an alternative because uh, the check is actually played. There's an alternative to taking which is just simply to move the king now to e2. The bishop's eyeing e1. It does seem like a computer-like defense all of this but it seems as though g5 has worked out well to restrain uh, the black king side against things like f5. So and, and th if there's nothing concrete uh, white seems to have you know very central and nice uh, bishops complementing each other across these diagonals. This pawn's potentially very dangerous still. It hasn't been captured but it might be, be handy. Um, the f file well white's actually threatening to take the rook now. Okay so black has to do something about that. He actually takes on f3, and after g takes f3, uh, he plays f5 anyway, even though en passant is possible. So Magnus does take en passant, g takes, and bishop takes. So was, was this worth doing? What was the idea of all of this f5 business? Well, it seems if we look at it, it does facilitate the queen shifting to try and get at the white king again. So actually, he did play the move now, queen h7. So maybe that was the idea. But now Magnus is Magnus's turn, as Bronstein says. It, you know, that's an advantage to be your turn, a very big advantage. With with this turn, okay. Although White's faced with an onslaught, it is his turn. What can he do with it? He can try and counterattack against the black king here. Okay, remember there's only there's only really two major attacking pieces. King's on the light square, it's a dark square bishop. This knight's not really helping. So can Magnus get away with this? Any attacking type move? He plays queen b5, which does introduce things like queen e8 check and knight c5 check, potentially. But what of these checks? What of queen h2? What if rook g2? Rook g2 is chosen. The king wanders to d3. So now I know it's not just my club games where my opponent's king's wandering around the board and getting away with it. But it seems to be in grandmaster games as well this happens. This king's taken a slight journey to get to d3. But where's the proof that black has any attack now? He actually just swaps off queens. He, he sees no better than to get the queens off with queen d7. Inviting queen takes d7 from Magnus. But what else was there here? Let's add a kibitza here. Is the attack blown? It doesn't seem as though there's much. So if we just rewind just for a moment, was this f5 the only approach? Apparently engine likes um, Maybe even rook g2 or bishop e5. Bishop e5 just to neutralize that strong bishop, maybe. So say bishop takes f7. If queen takes, then bishop e5. Bishop takes c3. B takes. Taking on b7. Apparently this, this is slightly better for white. Either king f2 or queen d6. So it was starting to be a tricky position, actually, for black. 
after this rook takes f3 and there wasn't really much better than rook takes f3 either so it seems as though this whole thing this whole like positional exchange sack combination that magnus has played allowing this rook h1 uh you know he he's he's strengthened his minor pieces the rooks um they're not quite backward rooks that new concept from from previous videos but they're not exactly the most effective rooks in the world um and especially if there's only one of them uh the attack that does seem to be fizzling out here there's this knight's beautifully centralized actually on e4 if you think about it these bishops have been beautiful throughout the game okay so this 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 is like an admission of defeat this this queen d7 check and there's not many moves left in the game after queen takes d7 so we have here a position white is the exchange down but for three pawns that's pretty significant number of pawns and not only that this this b7 pawn which for a long time was munchable is now protected with bishop d5 which actually makes it a serious tactical threat imagine the knight wasn't on d7 then knight c5 to a6 would be mate uh, so it can help weave a mating net under the right circumstances okay black now plays bishop e5 and magnus doesn't take on e5 he actually plays a super clever move a super clever move um f4 which apparently looks as though initially you might think oh what about this piece on f6 but the thing is this bishop has just been extended in scope backwards by playing f4 so if bishop takes then we would have knight takes uh threatening the rook and also threatening knight takes d7 winning outright because if king was b8 queening so this wouldn't be a good position knight takes bishop takes rook wouldn't be good so this is a brilliant move f4 played at move 37 i guess this is just before the move 40 you know time control uh brilliant move to play the exchange down bishop c7 was played and now this this crushing idea that i mentioned earlier where this pawn might form a mating there is actually emphasized now with this next move bishop c6 inviting positive for the knight takes f6 black had to resign here because if knight takes f6 knight takes not only attacking the rook but threatening knight d7 mate how embarrassing what else is there if knight b6 then i guess we can use knight c5 here to threaten knight a6 mate again hitting the rook discovered attack on the rook let's end and check that that but that pr seems pretty clear cut to me that knight c5 is a killing move here yes okay whoa so this f4 move in this position f4 seems pretty strong or was it why isn't it not mentioned it is mentioned a little bit what was going on here which which threw a spanner in the works out of interest takes takes maybe it wasn't so hot knight c5 check rook c2 but still white would be better but this is certainly uh different from the game where it's only like a pawn up for white in this variation initially it looked so convincing that the f4 move was so strong but here it's not so convincing black is the exchange uh up but it is uh for two pawns still check say knight f8 it's not that convincing it's, it's the exchange for two pawns with the bishop on a very dominant position holding on to a2 but still may you know maybe that's that's definitely better than the game continuation uh so th th this this was perhaps then in 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 the light of that bishop c7 was a disaster move because of bishop c6 so um and also what you know why is bishop takes e5 stronger maybe it's is it the king coming then in to help the pawn say so check king c3 and this just maintains the idea i think these ideas 
So say knight e1, we maintain that idea. Check just about with the knight on e1 supporting that. King d4. And now this would be a huge advantage for white. So Magnus's play wasn't, you know, even though he's 2826, even in this simplified position, uh, even f4, which looks visually like crushing, there was a stronger continuation here. Uh, you know, engines pedantic like that. <laughs> So f4, which looks really good, but black, you know, really blundered here. Then with with bishop c7, we can say scientifically, uh, bishop c6 knockout blow. Wow. This was a fun game. Let's go through this again in overview and summary. So it started off with a boring uh, Slav variation, but what a non-boring Slav game of the year! I would vote this. The most ex one of the most exciting high level Slav games of the year, where Black's getting that little bit of dynamism, White's positively, utterly inviting uh, fireworks on the H file pretty soon. The prelude to Black's attack is is releasing the tension in the center to play this thematic break, and then proceeding to play like a caveman shortly after this. So inviting even the exchange of queens might say no. Okay, play your caveman attack, castle queen side, sacrifice your bits. It is the town memorial after all. But um, we have here, you know, uh, basically an elephant gambit strategy. I'm using this strategy all the time for this diagonal for h2 in in, in chess cube war zones. It's elephant gambit type strategy without a defensive knight on f3. <laughs> And, and it's even a, a fishing pole type tactic coming up with the knight g4. These guys have clearly been watching uh, chess cube war zone videos. <laughs> so, so c takes b7 check. We've got a real hack and slay position here. And you know, Magnus treats the whole thing. The whole thing is treated as a positional sacrifice. You know, sometimes after a set of forcing moves, the evaluation needs to be very good. Other, you know, sometimes cal you know you need more than calculation; you need evaluation. So we have a set of forcing moves here from Black, but is the evaluation clear? Black technically has won the exchange, but it is uh, for one or two pawns. In fact, three pawns, isn't it, at the moment? Three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. Two pawns at the moment. Okay. So g5, which has this nifty idea of queen e4, it seems. I think that's the main intent after queen takes g5. Instead, we have rook dd1. And Magnus perhaps very wisely didn't play queen takes d1. He plays the very calm move knight g3. So he's invited um, some friends over for dinner, these rooks. Where, where the king is offered as the main course on f2. But how does the black queen and, and bishop help the two rooks here for the attack? It's tricky. It's, it's difficult to prove. Bishop d6 was played. Now we have this move queen e2, which the, lot, the, the strength of the last move was basically to weaken f1. You know, if bishop g3 was an option, we able to play rook f1. And now f1 is, is reinforced. Um, so rook g1. And not only that, of course, the queen shifting there, as well as supporting f1, is also attacking the rook, unveiling that, that direct attack on the rook. So the rook moved to g1. Very exciting stuff. And now this move queen d3. Let's just prove that, or do we need to prove it, that um, what was the major threat here if black didn't play bishop c7? Uh, did we investigate that? Excuse me, but I need to investigate this for my own personal interest. If black played a token move, we'll say king takes b7, is that totally lost? Rook takes f7, that loses the queen. So it's hard to play a token move. Okay, so a a6. Queen takes a6, that's not particularly. Rook c1, let's just give white a move. Okay, there's no major imminent threat here, it seems. Um, the problem is, if, if rook takes f7 here, I think it's bishop takes g3 check. 
I just wanted to show that there's no imminent threat really um, because of you know Bishop G3 is, is tying white down as a major threat I, I don't even think Bishop takes F7 I guess again Bishop takes G3 so white you know if 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 a token move like rook ac1 was played basically it doesn't seem like there's a knockout blow that's all i wanted to prove i did mention some pressure on d6 um but it, it might not be the case here so bishop c7 anyway was played and now knight e4 which is a nice centralization move the quality of the mining pieces are going up so it seems when you do a positional exchange sacrifice, if you're the one doing the positional exchange sacrifice, you look forward to getting more and more pawns, and also the piece quality of your minor pieces to be more and more in increasing, you know, better than the opponent's rooks, and hopefully the opponent's rooks to be less and less effective. And if you're the victim of such an exchange sack, you want to maximize, uh, keep maximum the quality of your rooks. But here it's difficult. The rooks are very committed to this first rank. So rook af1 check, and one rook pair of rooks were swapped off. So we have a more clear cut case where the the value of the minor piece versus the rook uh, seems stronger because look these these are very central and very coordinated pieces and all sort of lurking around the centre. So this looks a little bit like desperation now this f5 idea just to get the queen round the corner uh, with queen h7. Because it's quite a few pawns for the exchange now. So if there's nothing clear, if there's no clear mate coming up, and the king escaping now to d3, it's, it's another very precisely engineered move. Queen b5. Not only uh, the queen's menacing now for e8 check, but the king giving uh, given a spot on d3, which it now makes use of, and which it's difficult to, um, for black to arrange. He hasn't got time. If he plays something like queen h2 or queen h1, he's going to get mated now probably because of queen e8 and knight c5. Let's just prove that. Say queen h1. I'm not sure I did prove that in the first pass through this game. So mate in 5. Check. So say king takes knight c5 check. It's a mate in 5. That would be a mate there anyway. If bishop d8, that's that's the mate in 5, the slower way. You know, it's just mating. Okay, so uh, basically, um, if there was nothing better than the queens coming off, starting to look bad, but actually, uh, remarkably, f4 wasn't so crushing as first imagined. Uh, so this bishop c7 looks to be a disastrous blunder. So when in fact, in this position, um, instead of bishop c7, bishop takes f6, might have actually been possible because of this check which holds up d7 against knight d7 and where the rook can come in to support uh, the knight uh, for taking the pawn soon but even in this position might be slightly better but it's less than the pawn that that should have been played so this this is a total disaster move response to play bishop c7 because of this really crushing move which emphasizes the pawn as sort of mating that a facilitator um, after knight takes knight takes there's, there's the horrible threat of knight d7 mating okay i hope you enjoyed that i found that really quite in interesting exciting myself comments or questions on youtube thanks very much